so all this stuff is just out there. And what the Christian theological view of the world does is produce a new sort of layer of interpretation, a new, a new dimension of the way that people understood the natural world. It became, it became a way, this is you know, put very simply, it became a way that the Judeo-Christian Islamic God communicated with his, its, hers, theirs, <laughs> creatures, but traditionally his, creatures. Uh, uh, of of whatever sort, in particular, the rational creatures. Um, and you, so those of you who've had um, who've who've studied natural law theory with me, you remember the the rational creatures, um, the creatures who who've been given the faculty of reason and can use that faculty of reason. These creatures, in particular, the humans, also the angels, um, <laughs> but the humans um, are with with this faculty of reason. It turns out that nature itself is this form of communication by God and it is seen as something that uh, that that is that where each of the individual like forms like you know whether it's biological forms or geological forms or astronomical forms all you know all these different what we would call natural phenomena objects of scientific investigation are for people in this period individual messages individual messages or collective like a big collective message from the creator of the world the judeo-christian islamic monotheistic creator of the world this is the view of nature as a book as as a, as a book where it's like you know words on a page only it's you know it's the whole it's the whole planet it's it's the solar system it's the universe right where what we see is understood as a kind of um, as a as a kind of a semaphore. It's the it's those flags that that ships wave at each other to communicate things. You've probably seen seen it in cartoons or hieroglyphs, or uh, some kind of symbolism. Some kind of symbolism. We and, and you can see this. I mean, it's really easy for us if you cast your mind back to, you know, the thinking of astrologers. Oh, okay. So it's not just that you know Jupiter and Saturn just their orbits happen to have. Um, have, have coincided in a way visually for us on the third planet from the sun that, um, you know, they're, they're, they're next to each other, even, you know, they're hundreds of thousands of miles away. Um, no, we see that conjunction, the great conjunction as a sign, um, as a symbol in the book of nature telling us among other things, a plague is coming or a plague is happening. A pandemic is happening. So there, so you can see, so, so on the one hand, there's the straightforward astronomical account of that visually observable thing for us in the sky. You walk out there and you could see it this past fall, right? Um, but there is also, we can also see now the older sense that, oh, okay. So when, you know, when, when Mars is in, you know, this house, these kinds of things will happen, right? So I know a few of you are actually really up on the astrological knowledge here. What astrology is doing is seeing, in particular, astronomical nature, the nature of the skies, things that are lights in the sky, basically, um, as symbols, signs, letters, hieroglyphs, semaphores, um, the efforts at communication by the Judeo-Christian Islamic um, monotheistic God, so that what astrology is doing in the in in the Christian period now, not in not in the older period, but in the Christian period, what astrology is doing, and in you know, in the in the in the in the European tradition, but you, you get the same. We've seen this. You get the same kind of thinking in in the Islamic tradition, in the in the in Judaism, and frankly, in cultures all over the planet. Um, you get these. You get reads on what we would recognize as natural phenomena that are seen as signs or symbols or indications of some kind of a message, whether from the deities in a particular culture, um, or as uh, uh, some kind of indication about you know nature itself. It sort of depends on where we, where and when we are on the planet. In this in this period, in the period of the Europe of our period, nature is still seen as a form of communication by God to the rational creatures, the humans and the angels, but the humans who can use their reason to like think about what they're observing and then make inferences about the world as it would look to God. The world that we hear about 
in Revelation, in revealed religion, which are, which are the um, the religious texts of Judea, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. The religious texts say you don't have to you know you don't have to do any fancy guesswork there. It says this is how it is. You know the world was created here. This was the situation. Um, very specific. I mean, we can debate about what it all means and when it happened and so forth. And people obviously have and do. But with revealed religion, which is in from the perspective of the cultures here, you know, that's the word of God revealed, right? That's straight up. But for the book of nature, you have to have specialists like astrologers, later scientists themselves. The first job of science in the West was to interpret this book of nature, to understand the symbols that it that, that you can observe. And so the increasing care and um, uh, uh, meticulousness of observation and empirical research and recording of the of the of what of the findings was all an effort to see get closer to seeing the creation the way God saw it it was you know you're trying to get you're trying to understand you're trying to have knowledge well what's knowledge God's truth in the world still for these all of all of the people we're going to read with one exception what there is to what there is to know in nature is fundamentally first God's truth in the world. I mean, God creates the world. The true version of it is something he sees and no one else does in, the, in, in its totality. Science is an effort to get to part of it. So, um, so there, are these two, there are these two sort of parts of the backdrop here. The Book of Nature is much closer, although the Aristotelianism and its influence is also quite close. You need to, you need to have that in mind when we're looking both at what Blumenbach and Koguano point to when they're explaining racial difference, because we're going to get hybrid arguments. And with Caguano, we're going to get an explicit book of nature argument, a, a, a book of nature theory, um, which I'll get to in just a second. But I wanted you to see that when we get to that dimension of Caguano's thought, um, you know, it's got this, you know, he's not, he's not, he's not just coming up with this out of the blue. He's, he's, he's relying on a really well-established and, um, uh, accepted tradition um, when he when he points to these things and it makes his arguments for his time much much more powerful than you might than you might otherwise than you might otherwise think if you weren't familiar with the backdrop. Okay, so that's our big preamble there. Um, this week, having you know, we looked at various explanations for racial difference um, last week. This week we're focusing on monogenetic theories of racial difference. Blumenbach and Coguano. One of these theories is a racist theory. The other theory, with a possible exception that Adamson notes in his podcast, that, you know, Coguano makes some remarks about, this is when he's talking about um, the leopard and the spots and the skin of the Ethiopian, right? There's a, he treads slightly in a direction that, that might play into um, more racist theories, but, you know, he's writing in a context and he pulls back from that. You remember that Adamson um, gave, us, gave us an overview there. Um, so here we're going to see two monogenetic theories of race. One of them is what we would call a racist theory, and the other one is not. And the other one, except for you know the other part of its, the other half of its theory, is much closer to the modern consensus that I talked to you guys about about last week. So, monogenetic theories of race. You remember one origin for humans, which means one species. There are not multiple species of human beings. There's one species of human beings. And as we saw when, in Popkin's overview of monogenetic theories of race, the most monogenetic theories in Europe and in the, in, in, in the colonies in the United States later, um, later on at the end of the 18th century, um, are the, 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 these theories explain racial variety, what we would call racial and ethnic variety, by referring to degeneration this was this and so this was a this was a something i flagged for you guys last week something popkin talks about when we read when you read blumenbach's text you were reading one of the classic texts in monogenetic um race race theories of theory of ra theories of racial difference um that explains the variety by degeneration so there's an original way everyone's one origin one species but that or that one species has as its origin a particular form and in particular, a particular color, and all the variety we see that's different from that color now has come after the fact as a result of what Blumenbach and these people call degeneration. 
as we'll see, Caguano is going to give us a, a, a monogenetic theory that doesn't involve degeneration. It, there, there, is, there is not degeneration. It, degeneration is not the cause of variety. So these two theories share the one origin, one species. So it doesn't, you know, it doesn't have the, the hopelessness, as Popkin says, and a number of you agreed with him last week, um, of the polygenetic theories of race, um, which we'll revisit here in just a bit. But, and they share this, so they share this, but Blumenbach explains the variety by degeneration, whereas Caguano doesn't see it as degeneration. He doesn't see it as degeneration. And the other, the other most important thing about Caguano is he doesn't designate one particular variety as the original variety from which the others have differed or varied. He doesn't pick one. He comes at this, he comes at this a little differently. So Blumenbach, so one race, many varieties. That's our monogenetic theory, you know, that's our monogenetic theories of racial difference. Blumenbach, one race that varies by degeneration, by by falling away and becoming less perfect and less uh, good. Um, primarily, the degeneration for Blumenbach, and this is true for a number of these guys, this is going to be another very interesting similarity to Coguano, although not by degeneration. Degeneration happens for Blumenbach primarily by different, what we would call differences in climate. Uh, so you're looking at the planet and you're looking at the peoples on the planet. This is going to sound very familiar, right? And people, uh, uh, in terms of where they originated, um, we would say phenotypically, the, the, the places on the planet where people or have their origin from differ significantly in their climates, in their temperatures, in the amount of sun they get, in how humid they are, all, a whole a host of climactic uh, variations depending on where you are on the planet. Now, obviously, today, things the climate itself is changing. These guys can't even imagine that. And so you and I live in a world where, you know, this, even that's like slippery material. But um, so, so, but Blumenbach, you know, he's looking at, he's looking at, okay, so one race, many varieties. How do you get the varieties? By degeneration. How do you get degeneration? By the different effects of climate, of the climate on that one original race across the globe. Blumenbach designates what he calls and what what in in the United States people some people still do call um, not the census anymore um, although well no I think it's still listed on the census Caucasian which means from the Caucasus like the country of Georgia among others right it, it was that part of Europe where they thought the most beautiful people were what they mean here is white what they mean here is white um, the Blumenbach designated the Caucasian or the white race race as primeval first it came first in time so the one race at, in its origin was caucasian meaning everybody in the beginning was white adam was white eve was white all those biblical people are white um everybody else who is not white in some gradation or another has got there by degeneration caused by climate differences caused by climate differences now, Caguano, as I've already suggested, agrees. You start with one race. We've got one race, many varieties, one origin, one species. And it varies by geographic location. But Caguano won't designate any one of those varieties, as I said, as primeval. He does something else instead. He says instead, and he's specifically, and you saw this in the text, specifically citing biblical text, explicit biblical text. All of the humans, the entire species, is descended from Noah and, you know, and his, you know, Noah's sons, Noah's family. These are the people, for those of you who are not familiar with this tradition, uh, uh, in the, in the, in the uh, Judeo-Christian Islamic text that the Christians call the Old Testament, okay, the first, the first part of it, um, there is a universal flood um, that kills everything except what Noah, who got, you know, uh, a warning um, from God who told him, you know, collect the animals, get on the boat. I'm going to flood everything, wipe it all out and start over, hit reset. But you guys are going to survive. The humans who, you know, who, who then live into the future after that are all descended from Noah on this theory. So Caguano doesn't, doesn't, he doesn't 
say anything about what Noah looks like. He doesn't pick one of the existing, what are for him, the contemporary, contemporaneous, I should say, the contemporaneous racial varieties and say it's primeval and that's what Noah was. Um, he just says that people all over the world are different in different geographic locations, but we do know that they're all descended from Noah. We do know that they're all descended from Noah. Um, and he even, he even cites, uh, uh, in the text that you read, he even cites um, passages that say that, you know, descended from Noah that are of one blood, that are of one blood. So, and this is, you know, this is, this is a specific counter to um, the notion that different races had different bloods, which is the origin of the one drop of blood rule that, that underwrites um uh, you know, as we'll see towards the end of the lecture, um, the, the, the specific um, uh, uh, legalized uh, racialism of, in, in particular, the Americas, but also, as Popkin pointed out to us um, last week, that has its origin in um, distinguishing converted Catholics who, you know, ha who had been Jews from non-Jews, people who hadn't or whose families hadn't been Jews. That sort of one drop of blood rule has its origins in Spain um, initially. And some of you may be familiar, um, if you've ever seen any um, uh, parish birth records um, from central from churches in Central and South America, you may be familiar with, um, and you might not even you might not even realize it. You may be familiar with the words um, uh, without necessarily realizing that this is where it comes from. So, in the Catholic Church, in um, its holdings in Central and South America. Uh, notably in Mexico, what we didn't, what we know today of is Mexico, uh, kept records, um, extremely precise records of the um, ancestry and parentage of people born into the Catholic Church in Mexico in this period, um, particularly in terms of their their the, the racial identity, the racial ethnic identity of their ancestors, and they came up with there's something like there's a there's a there's a there's a list of something like 20 25 different words expressing different percentages of Indian, meaning the indigenous peoples of Mexico, African, the people who who were kidnapped and brought as slaves, and white the the Spaniards the Europeans um, and and they take it down to like decimal points of percentages and each gets a different each gets a different name that's all based on the one drop of blood rule Caguano when he says you know the human species is all of one blood is because he's writing this in 1787 you know well after all of this is developed you know for like a couple hundred years he's pushing back on this notion that different races different varieties have different kinds of blood that you could say oh there's black blood and white blood and brown blood and yellow blood and all these different colors of blood okay so the causal accounts with our backdrop about causation um as I said, Blumenbach and Conguano both attribute racial differences to climate, that is, climate differences. Blumenbach says that the gen degeneration from white, Caucasian, is caused by the action of the sun on two, two parts of our physical bodies, the skin and the liver, and the liver, which produces, the liver is what produces bile. This second aspect of, of, of the human body that, that Blumenbach is referring to when he, when, he, when, he talk, when he focuses on the liver. I don't know how the sun gets to your liver, but we're going to go with it. Um, <laughs> it's hanging outside there. Um, bile is one of the four humors. It's one of the four substances in which um, uh, the human bodily function and, and, and malfunction are explained by pre-modern medicine. But, you know, the, the humoral theory, the theory, you, you explain everything in terms of humors. It's got a long life and it's, and it's you know, it's, it's going strong in Europe in this period. Um, so when he says that the sun affects the liver, and which produces the bile, he's saying that this is a, what Blumenbach is doing is he's, uh, he's, he is locating the source of blackness in a different place than the anatomist we looked at last week in, in the Quran excerpt. They located it in a layer of skin. 
Blumenbach is going to locate it in, in one, of the, one of the fluids that courses through the body. He says, because the sun influences the liver, and, you know, not just blackness, but blackness, brownness, intermediateness, all the different racial and ethnic, what we would call racial and ethnic varieties, are caused by changes in the way the, the bile that's produced by the liver, the, this particular fluid that courses over the body, changes, it changes the color, changes the way people appear to us. So the sun acts directly on the skin, for Blumenbach, and it acts on the liver, which is, you know, which means it, what it's doing is producing changes in the bile. Everybody's white to begin with. When people disperse over the course of the planet, the differences in the climate, the amount of sun, affect the skin and the liver and the production of bile to produce different varieties. Where white, everybody's white to begin with, and that's the very, you, so you vary from white, and Blumenbach is quite clear about this, as all of these guys who, who do the degeneration theory are. Um, Buffon is another really notable one of these guys. I didn't ask you to read him. Um, it's not just these, these people are white, the one species are white, they're also the most beautiful. This, the reason they set it up this way, right, this is European ideology, you know, as, it, as its most intent. It's, it's the, we would, I mean, it's, it's actually the historical backdrop to white nationalism, the way we know it today, unfortunately, too much today. Um, everybody before Eve pulls the apple off the tree and eats it, right? Go back to our, our story of Adam and Eve, is with God, close to God, um, children of God, no separation from God by sin. The story in the Old Testament, um, the Judeo-Christian Islamic religious text, text in the book of Genesis says, so the, when, when Eve says, here, check this out, this great apple, whatever, takes on um, knowledge of good and evil and all this stuff, you know, they're not supposed to be having, lose their innocence, commit the original sin, they fall away from God, and they become sinners. They become sinners. And that falling away from God makes them less perfect and less blessed and less godly you know, children of God-like, right? Not, not so close anymore. They get further away um, in, a, in a view of life that, see, that sees people that, if they get to return at all, it's only after they're dead and they go to heaven. That's when you, you know, when you get, that's the only, that's the only way to get back um, in most of these traditions, although you know, Judaism doesn't have heaven in this regard. Um, that's a later development with Christianity and Islam. So, but when people fall away from the original perfect form, that's the Genesis account of, um, human beings early on you know, in in the, in the garden of eden right so the folly so to be to be to be in your original untampered with state uncontaminated and unsinning state unsinning is to be white for the europeans european and beautiful it's the most beautiful race it's the white race it's the most beautiful white race and it's the it's the least falling away from god we're closer to god than anybody else i mean this is straight up nationalism right the other tribes, or however you want to characterize it, they're lesser. They are further from God. They're sinners. They're they're infidels. They're all kinds of other things, but they're away. Our people, we're there. Um, so that's 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 what that's what this theory is. Then and now, and now, Caguano, on the other hand, says the original people, and this is a direct quotation, were all of one complexion. Complexion is a way to refer to. Um, among other things, the color, like the way of your skin, right? You could probably think about it in terms of like, um, you know, does someone have clear skin or not clear skin or what have you? Um, all of one complexion. Well, what Kogano means is, well, they were all alike. Whatever that was, he doesn't specify, as I mentioned earlier. Kogano is like, whatever, but it was all the same. So to that extent, he's agreeing with Blumenbach. Everybody was something at the beginning and it was all the same thing. But assigning the same causation, he doesn't talk about the skin and the liver. He's writing a little bit later than, than, than Blumenbach, and he's not adopting those specific theories. He's, he says that people develop varieties after they dispersed across the planet. People, they began to vary in terms of their complexion. We would say phenotype. You know, it's features, hair, uh, physical structure, skin, all these other things, right? People begin to develop varieties after they, you know, populate, move across the planet. But Caguano says that they did that. Those varieties emerged in order to help 
the members of the human species, the one species, whatever the complexion they were, to help them endure their respective climates. Kaguano thinks people moved out across the planet and they started to change. You know, we would say mutations were favorably selected over, you know, tens of thousands of years, hundreds of thousands of years to make people healthier and survive better and be able to reproduce and so on. That That's the, that's the, you know, today's evolutionary theory, so that phenotypical differences are adaptational to different environments. And that's why you see all this racial and ethnic variety. Well, Kaguano's not going there, but he's quite clear. The racial variety that develops after the creation of a, a, a species, a, a, a one species of humans, all of one complexion, whatever that is, they varied because their lives were better with those different phenotypes. Their lives were better. Instead of, you know, suffering, you know, vitamin D deficiencies in Europe because you're not getting enough sun or, um, uh, uh, you know, terrible skin conditions in the, you know, along the equator, right? Um, in the equatorial regions for lack of enough melanin in your skin, right? You know, just, just sort of the pick two, like the, the, the obvious variety. Instead of suffering in those ways, in those climates, they were like, they had better lives. They lived longer and they could have, you know, you know, they could reproduce and have children and, you know, live happily ever after. Um, he mentions other incidental causes, lifestyle, ways of life. And that's something that, um, that Blumenbach and also Buffon will mention, you know, just people eating different foods and, and, you know, the, 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 the degeneration theorists, the, the people like Blumenbach will say, you know, well, they, um, they run around naked all the time and that's sinful. Remember the whole Garden of Eden thing you're supposed to cover up, right? Because, you know, to be naked is to be, is to, is to, is, is, because now that you know good and evil, you can't be naked. All you've got to, you've got to put clothes on, right? This classic book of Genesis stuff. If this isn't your tradition, just look, look up Wik, book, book of Genesis on Wikipedia. Um, you get the backstory. So there, so, so different, you know, they, 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 the Europeans would like show up in North America and the indigenous peoples wouldn't dress necessarily the same way that the Europeans did. And sometimes they were like half naked and, you know, that's, that became a, a standard way to refer to indigenous peoples in a pejorative degrading way. Oh, they're, they're stark naked or they're half naked. That's a, like, you know, it's a terrible thing. Some of the gener degeneration theorists saw that as contributing to their phenotype, to their complexion. To make it made them darker, it made them less white, because it was a more sinful way of living. So you can see the direct inheritance of the sort of Book of Genesis account of original sin played out in terms of these, what look like physical, mechanical, causal accounts of racial variety. Caguano, on the other hand. He agrees. He just doesn't think, he just doesn't name the original. He doesn't pick a variety as the original. And he says all that change, all that variation just made their lives better in their different climates. And, you know, biologically and physically, Kaguano wins this argument. He's, I mean, right, he, he nails it. He's going to do something else with it for his time, for his time. But um, what's interesting for us is to see how much they share Blumenbach and Colguano, and their crucial dis and their crucial disagreements, especially when we're trying to make sense of the way that modern philosophers and modern natural philosophers, scientists, explain things. So this is all sort of very you know naturalist and biological and you know anthropological and all this stuff right now. Well, the same kind of variety is going to show up when we get to. Um, when we get to um, Leibniz and Bentley and Newton and we and Berkeley and we hear about the origin and nature of the universe, because these guys are going to make the same kinds of arguments, the same kinds of arguments about you know why the planets orbit the sun. They're going to make the same the same kinds of the same same sort of we'll, we'll we'll see. They're going to make the same kinds of arguments, and it's in the same tradition. So it's really helpful to have this as a backdrop to sort of see where these guys are coming from. Okay. In order to attribute racial difference to different climates in different geographical locations, these guys have to have and then base or found their conclusions 
on what today we would call empirical observation. And so we've got this like overtly religious, for Blumenbach too, he, and I'll say, I'll make this point in a second, Blumenbach does the same thing. He doesn't come out and announce it. Oh, you know, God created everybody originally white. He doesn't say that, although even my phrasing it that way should remind you of the trial court judge in Loving versus Virginia, which I'll get to in just a second. Um, um, Blumenbach doesn't come out and say that, but you know, the fact that he wasn't burned at the stake in France for blasphemy or heresy tells you that uh, he, he, you know, he, in other venues, he was quite clear um, that, you know, the original single species white was created by the Judeo-Christian Islamic monotheistic God. The interesting thing is, so you've got this theological explanation for the existence and the appearance of human beings that is blended, blended with an increasingly what we would call scientific or empirical series of observations. Now, what Blumenbach is giving us the, the, in all those passages where he's describing the different species, you know, this one, these features and so on, what Blumenbach is giving us are actually digest summaries of the um, reports of Europeans who on European ships sailed around the world and made and took notes, made observations, as I mentioned a couple of weeks ago, about the different indigenous peoples that they encountered in various parts of the planet. So the empirical observation there is, oh, you know, Captain so-and-so came back and I was able to consult his journal and these are the observations he made on the Polynesians kind of thing. Um, so it's a, it's a, that's why I say here, relatively informal empirical observation, but nonetheless, it was a departure from a world that didn't found, that didn't, ex that didn't point to any, hardly any empirical observation to speak of the way we would recognize it to explain something. And notice too, you've got this sort of, right, you've got theological causation, you know, God creates Adam and, you know, Eve out of, out of a rib of Adam. And, you know, there's very straightforward theological account of the existence of human beings. But then when it comes to the variety, the causes are all physical, mechanical, the sun hitting the skin, the sun hitting the liver mysteriously, um, and making the bile be different, right? So it, there's like this, this blend, I'm going to call it a hybrid of theological explanation with increasingly sci or emergently scientific explanation that if in one in one in, in in to put it very briefly is one of the major themes of the class this semester is to is to pay attention to the way that western science western science emerged as a as a as a and as, as an accessory to theological explanations of the world and of the phenomena in it science caguano Blumenbach as well attributes, as I said, the ultimate origin of humans to the divine, to divine creation. Caguano says, and this is a quotation from his page 32, all of this is the work of an almighty hand. And that's what it sounds like when you actually say, and by the way, this one original species in Caguano's case of one complexion, who knows which one, the work of an almighty hand. This is, this is the reference to the Judeo-Christian Islamic God. For Caguano, it's the Christian God. Kath, the, Kathy's already said, this is a hybrid argument from our perspective, both scientific and religious. Sorry, we're trying some new tech today. It's known, if you're not familiar with these things, as a clothespin. And it's slower, but slightly more secure. This hybrid argument, as I've suggested, is very different than the much later but less modern argument that's made by the trial court judge in the Loving case, okay? So cast your mind back to the practice explication and the way the trial court judge made that argument. That's a polygenetic argument. That's a polygenetic argument. The, as I mentioned um, two weeks ago the, and, and last week, the, the trial court judge in the Loving case that, that convicted um, um, Richard Loving and Mildred Jeter of anti-miscegenation, mixing the blood in the in in the in the in the in Virginia's um, and under under their anti-miscegenation uh, crimin that criminalizes mixed race marriages. Right, that judge, the original the original judge who convicts them, um, 
is a polygeneticist. He argues that the Christian God created each race separately and placed each on different continents. Notice how different that is as a causal theory from either Blumenbach, who's also a racist, but he's a different kind of a racist, and Caguano, right? They clearly see the human species as having one origin and being one group. The trial court judge, the trial court judge, thinks that human beings were created separately in separate forms. Okay, here's this one and here's this kind and here's that kind. And he gives us a list, right? We also, I mean, Linnaeus doesn't talk about this, but in the, that, that, that sort of, um, that old style print uh, text from Linnaeus, um, his taxonomy of, of human, of types of human beings, Linnaeus pretty clearly, particularly when he gets to, you know, the monstrous, is also a polygeneticist. He thinks that he thinks that each of these forms was created separately, or at least a number of these forms were created separately. The monsters were created separately. The human beings, the homo sapiens, the homo uh, uh, genus types of humans were never monsters and were never monstrous. Um, this notice, the trial court judges argument, leave Linnaeus aside for a second, but the trial court judge's argument, that little argument you had, you did for the practice explication, that's a purely religious argument. That's a purely religious argument. Now, it doesn't belong in a, in a judicial opinion in, you know, 1954, um, or 59, or whatever it was, um, in 1959, but nonetheless, people do these things, and we know this. Um, so the trial court judge makes a straightforwardly, you know, Christian religious argument that God created the races separately and placed each on different continents. That's a purely religious argument, you know, 150, 200 years after Blumenbach and Caguano are already giving us these hybrid arguments of, um, of, uh, that combine theological with what we would call scientific explanation. So the trial court judge was a throwback in so many ways. It's why it's so amazing, um, uh, and I think that's why the U.S. Supreme Court decided to quote him, because when they, when, in, the, in the opinion, when they reverse his decision, and, you know, the famous case of Loving versus Virginia, I think they quoted him in order to say, you know, dude, you're, this is old-fashioned. You can't, this isn't going to fly anymore. The polygenetic theories of race, no, we're done with that. I think that's why the U.S. Supreme Court decided in that opinion to quote him, because he made a fool of himself. Now, he obviously, clearly... You, you, I don't know whether we, I didn't focus on this, but you know the sentence in the Loving case, what the Lovings had to do, they didn't even jail them. He just said you have to leave Virginia and not come back for 25 years. That was the criminal sentence because you know they went to D.C. to get married and they came back to Virginia to live because that's where they're from, that's where their families are. Um, and the judge said, no, you can't live in Virginia. Um, I'm going to convict you of this crime, and then my punishment, your punishment, is never to come back for, to Virginia for 25 years. It's like, well, okay. The most important thing that would happen in the intervening 25 years, that judge would die. He's obviously, you know, a dinosaur. And I don't, by that, I don't mean to be picking on the dinosaurs. Okay. Um, Caguano, who is, um, who, you know, he's writing at a, you know, the, his book is coming out somewhat later than, than Blumenbach's. And he's, and in, and in many ways, he's a more sophisticated thinker about sort of the big picture stuff here. Um, he captures the hybrid, this hybrid argument, this sort of blend of theological and scientific argument perfectly, but with echoes of this, um, and we'll, 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 we'll see this in a second, with echoes of this book of nature. So bring that back from the front of the lecture, this, this book of nature concept, right? He captures this hybrid form of argument perfectly when he says, and this is on his page 32, the internal pages right there in the text, he says that something can be reasonably as well as religiously inferred and Adamson drew our attention to this line as well this 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 these conclusions that he's drawing about racial variety he says we can draw those conclusions reasonably by and by reasonable he doesn't mean you know not being ira not being unreasonable he means i mean he does but he means using our using our faculty of reason as well as religiously that is, people who are reading the book or you know, reading reading the, the religious text, the, the revealed word of God in, you know, for him, it's the Old New Testament, the Christian Bible. But, you know, pick the monotheism. It's got the same status, right? You can infer it religiously, you know, so all of one blood descended from Noah, as well as reasonably. I'll talk about that, what that comes to in just a second. He, he, he's, quite, he's quite explicit. He says, look, I'm making a hybrid argument here. I am using my reason to look at observable, empirically observable natural phenomena, namely, you know, human variety and, you know, where it exists on the planet. 
and I'm reading the Bible and I'm seeing what the revealed word of God is telling me about the origin of human beings, particularly after the great flood and, you know, only Noah and his family survive. And I am drawing the same conclusion. And this is, this is, this is, this is like the Holy, the, the Holy Grail. That's a, that's a terrible, uh, this is the jackpot. <laughs> this is, this is sort of the, the argumentative jackpot um, for people in the period. And so, you know, Caguano knows he's like, I've got, I've got all the aces, basically, if he were playing, I don't mean to attribute to him, you know, the sin of gambling, but if he were playing, a, if he were playing a card game, he'd say, look, I've got all the aces here. And he's, and he's actually, he's actually, when he does this, he knows, cause he knows the tradition and he's, you know, he's very sophisticated about it. And he's saying, Hey, look, my argument's way better than yours. He's saying to Blumenbach and to people like the trial court judge in, in loving, in the loving case, right? Cause he's got it. He's got them two ways. He, he can do the, he can do the empirical observation and he can read his revealed, you know, word of God, religious text, and they come up with the same conclusion. Cause that's the, that's, and that's what I mean by the jackpot, the Holy Grail. When you, when you're reading the book of nature and you're looking at the, and you're looking at the, what he calls emblems, signs, symbols, um, representations, hieroglyphs, semaphores, whatever, um, and you get one conclusion, and then you go and you read the Bible, the, the Christian, in this case, the Christian Bible, it's what Kuguano is doing, and you get the same conclusion, you've got, you know you, you read the Book of Nature right, because they match. It's like doing two different, um, it's like two, it's like, you know, we say, oh, okay, well, what's the efficacy of the vaccine in relation to this variant, you know, the current COVID discussion, right? Well, let's do another study, and if both studies produce the same outcome you have more evidence that that might be that that you know stronger evidence that that's the right one that's for Caguano that's what he's saying he's like look I ran this I ran this two ways I ran it through my use of reason looking at reading the book of nature and I read my religious text and I got the same conclusion <laughs> I have this I have this and you guys are like miles behind um and you and and as you know We'll see in a second when Conguano draws these conclusions, he's doing so in the service of like, you know, a matter of life and death. He's trying to save his people. He's trying to save his people from death, from torture, from enslavement, from the loss of total loss of freedom, from all of the horrors of slavery. So, I mean, this is, I mean, I know I'm, I'm, I'm sort of playing this up, but I mean, this is deadly serious business. He, he pulled out all the stops. He had the chops to do it intellectually and philosophically. And he, and he, I mean, he makes the, he makes the winning argument. Doesn't mean you're going to win in terms of you know power, or you know overthrow a bunch of empires all at once. But he made the winning argument. He made, he has the best argument here, clearly, um, and he's doing it you know passionately because you know it's a matter of life and death. People are dying, and people are enslaved, and people are being tortured, and their, their whole lives are being destroyed. Whole cultures are being destroyed. Um, indigenous cultures, all people's cultures, and he thinks it's destroying the Europeans too as you, you, you will recall, because he's warning, and Adamson talks about this, he's warning the British, look, this is going to come back and get you at some point. You, you don't want to be doing this. You should be rising up and saying, don't do this anymore, because we don't want the divine retribution for this terrible thing that we're doing. Caguano's emblem theory, and Adamson talks about this towards the end of his the segment on Caguano before he gets to Equiano, um, sp- it is a specific invo is it is it is a it's a it's a purposeful invocation of this this notion of nature as a book so the racial variety distributed as it is on the planet that fact that natural fact is an emblem or a sign from god and so when Caguano's having this argument with the other racial the, the other people who are explaining racial difference he says look I'm reading the book of nature and I think I've got, it's like saying I got an email from God or I got a text from God and I don't mean to be blasphemous here. I'm just like, you know, he's saying, look, I have this. I really have this. I'm reading this and um, you can't, if you just look at this thing, you should be seeing the same thing I am. And plus it's backed up by, as I mentioned earlier, the book. Um, I've already mentioned the similar structure that astrology has. So I don't need to do that again. Uh, So in this view, this, this, this under, under Kogono's emblem theory that, that observation, things that we observe in nature are signs and symbols of divine communication. God is telling us things. The physical differences among the races living in different places. So the original human species that are all of one complexion, all of one blood descended from Noah disperses over the planet. 
the different the the emer the, the the differences that emerge there that are caused by the climate and it's various and primarily by the climate in different places that very fact and I mentioned earlier right it actually made people's lives better to change in that way depending on where they were living it's a sign or an emblem of God's providence that is what God provided for the well-being of his creatures, and in particular, the human creatures. So God thought about it in advance and said, hey, you know, it, if, if, if they're going to live on different parts of the planet, you know, that have these different climates, they need, to, they, need to, they need to change so that their lives will be healthy and happy and flourishing, you know, for long histories and so on in those different places. And so Caguano says, if you look out at the racial variety, across the planet, we're actually reading a symbol in the book of nature telling us that God cares for and loves his creatures. I mean, them's fighting words, right? It's very hard to say, oh, God's providence, and just sort of blow that off. Even, you know, the guys, he's, the people he's writing for should have, should have looked at that and said, okay, this is, a, this is a really serious argument. We need to take this seriously. Um, and as Adamson points out, Caguano's making a moral and political argument on this foundation, um, and this, you know, this is this is this is this is why this text is so fabulous because the argument he's making is so tight. Is that you really like it when all the parts of the argument for us are explicit? We can explicate them. In fact, you guys saw his argument. If you if you're looking at the sample explication, the one up in the folder on electronic reserve, this I, my version is of this of this. You can see the ex, of that explication, and you can read the original arguments. An excerpt from the text you read for this week. It's a really tight, a really well-made, strong argument. Um, the differences between people that are a sign of God's care for them, God's providence, you can't then turn around and point to those differences and say these are grounds for enslavement of one race by another. Right? So Caguano says, look, these differences themselves are signs or emblems. Just the fact of the racial differences themselves are signs of God's providence. God is talking to us through our natural differences and saying, I love you and I care for you. I mean, this is this is major in, in these traditions, in the Judeo-Christian Islamic traditions, when someone is saying, this is a sign that God loves you and loves us. This is like serious business, right? You can't turn around and point to those differences and say, and this is why the Europeans get to enslave the Africans and why it's legitimate and just and even called for by our respective religions. Kaguana's like, you can't do that. This is God's providence. You can't use it. You can't use it as a justification to enslave people and kill them and torture them and take away their freedoms, etc., etc., etc. It's a fabulous argument. It's a really fabulous argument. And as I suggested, it's the stronger argument. So while Kaguana's argument that the British must abolish slavery, as I mentioned earlier, in order to avoid punishment by God is a purely religious argument, and it is, it's got practical and political consequences. His argument for um, his monogeneticist argument is a merge. It's merged theological and scientific, theological and scientific. And so, and, and notice, it's not like it's all, it's like it's incoherent. It's all completely tightly packed in. Coguano's case for, in particular, the British abolition of slavery, not just in Britain, but in, 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 the, in, in all of its colonies and all of its, you know, everywhere. Don't participate in the slave trade. Just because you don't let slaves come into Britain, doesn't, that doesn't wash your hands clean. You guys are still making boatloads of money, shipping slaves across to the West Indies and so on. Plus, they owned, had still maintained all those holdings in the Caribbean, um, where they were themselves owning the plantations and owning the slaves who worked on them. Um, owning and torturing and all of those other things, those slaves. So it's a super tight argument. It's a fabulous argument. And um, for our purposes, it's a really beautiful illustration of how theological and emerging scientific argument works together. And that'll, that'll tell us a lot about how, you know, what's coming. Um, and it helps us see at the same time how how somebody who's like you know really good at this kind of thing, really good at like philosophical argument, can make a really good, a really solid, a really compelling moral and political argument using philosophical, using philosophical and scientific resources. Okay. Now, last bit, bit of a shift. The other thing I had I had you read for this week. Excerpts from the Laws of Colonial Virginia. These are um, 17th and 18th century 
statutes in the colony of Virginia, British colony. Um, it's a it's a it's a colony founded by a corporation rather than a religious group like Massachusetts. It's founded by a company. Um, Massachusetts, it's it's more mixed. Um, partly corporate, partly religious. In Virginia, it was straight on corporate. Um, what we see is a series in Henning, this is the Henning text, what we see are a series of regulations of, in particular, um, labor, uh, more specifically, what's called indentured labor in the Virginia colony in this period. Um, this is the main backbone of this is the backbone of what in, becomes in the United States in the in the in the pre-revolutionary colonies and in the United States the legal concept of slavery insofar as it is tied directly to race because you know as, as you know and Kuguano talks about this you see slavery all throughout human history all the time that the slavery in the United States was special and different because the Europeans tied it tied the condition of being a slave to being of a certain race or partly of a certain race. And this is the direct violation of what Coguano has just argued here, right? Um, so, you know, people would be captured in wars in the past and they would just, you know, they'd have to go home with the conquerors and serve them. That would be their slavery. But the condition wasn't heritable by their children and it didn't have, it wasn't tied in any way to um, who they were. They could be freed and live freely and, you know, prosper in that new society as best they could without, I mean, it wasn't in any way tied to being who they were to be a slave. The new and exciting thing that the Americans did was to tie it. The Europeans did was to tie it. Um, that concept of slavery, as I said, comes out of the regulation of what are initially indentured servants in the Virginia colony, in, the, in this colony. What's an indentured servant? And why is she saying servant instead of slave? Here we go, ready? An indenture is a contract. It's like your cell phone contract or your, uh, the, the lease on your apartment. An indenture is a contract. <clears throat> it's an agreement on the part of the servant, the person who will be the servant, to work for, and this is crucial, it's crucial that you understand this, to work for a term of years. The closest thing in, in, the, in, the, in, in our world that you can think about is that, you know, when you say, for example, in exchange for um, certain benefits, like, you know, paying for your education, the U.S. military, you then owe the U.S. military a certain number of years. You, you have to serve in the military for X number of years. Um, you know, you'll, you'll hear friends, or I hear my students all the time saying, well, I owe them another, you know, I know, I, I know owe them another year. I know, owe them another three years or whatever it is. So in exchange for this, for signing up and in exchange for the, for the benefits that you get for signing up, you have to serve a certain number of years. That thing is, that agreement with the U.S. military is structured like the contract under which an indentured servant would, would, would work. What happened was that, um, England and other corporate forces, when they showed up in Virginia and they realized um, that they could make an enormous amount of money if they grew tobacco there and exported it around the world, they realized that they needed um, people to work on those tobacco plantations and in the processing and so on. That's, it's a very labor-intensive thing. This is, the, this is the 17th century, the 16th, 17th century. It's very early, um, you know, very early in the 17th century when the things really start taking off. Um, and they needed labor. They were hoping that the indigenous, um, the populations indigenous to North America would do that labor, but they didn't. They were like, excuse me, I'm just going to go west. You people are horrible. Um, uh, you know, it's a big country and the Europeans weren't out there. So all you had to do was leave. Right. And that's, that's, part, that becomes crucial, uh, here in just a second when it comes to this, the development here. Um, the, the African slave trade had, you know, gotten, you know, had, had started, but it wasn't, it wasn't going, it wasn't producing the number of people that it begins to later on. And so what the Virginia colony needed were more Europeans to come and work in the tobacco plantations. And the way they got it was they went to, um, this isn't going to sound as implausible as it did when I was teaching this 20 years ago. Um, they would go to prisons 
they would go to prisons in England. These were special prisons um, in England where people who had gotten into debt, who owed people money, had been placed in order to work off their debts. We don't, we don't um, explicitly have debtors prisons any longer um, in the United States or in Europe, but I would say that some of the practices that prisons are engaging in now are inching pretty close to debtor's prison. And basically people are still incarcerated primarily because they're in debt. And that's really the only reason. You don't go, you don't go to prison if you don't pay your Citibank bill. If you don't, you don't pay your Citibank bill. But um, there are other ways that, that, that the, um, that the uh, mass incarceration system gets people on debt, as, as some of you probably know. Um, what, the, what, what the people who were trying, the recruiters for the colony, the corporation, um, did was that they would go to debtor's prison and then say, hey, we'll pay your debts for you, get you out of debtor's prison, but you have to ship to Virginia, the Virginia colony, ship to the new world, it's the new world, and work X number of years. You've got to work X number of years, a term of years. And so these are, you know, white English people who are saying, yeah, I'd love to get out of debtor's prison. You know, what choice did they have? Um, and I will go and work. I will immigrate to the new world um, in your ships and I will work on the plantations for X number of years and then I'll be free and I won't owe the debt anymore and my indenture will have come to an end. My contract will have come to an end. The other reason that both the British crown, the nation, the country, the king, the queen, um, and the colony pursued this is because of those not so great relations with the indigenous American populations. They needed people on the ground. I mean, you can see this in, in a few places here on the planet today. If you've got a, a territorial conflict with somebody, what you want to do is displace their people and put your people in, settle in settlements, your people there, because you can hold them better if you've got people who like, you know, who think of this as their own thing. And so you want a settlement to, um, you want a settlement full of people who will fight for it like their own so you don't have to run around fighting for it all the time. And so you, they needed Europeans, they needed English people to come and um, populate that part of the colony, populate the colony to keep the indigenous population at bay, to fight them and fight, fend them off. And also to keep, you know, the French out and keep some of the other European po possible populations out and to sort of, you know, when necessary, serve as a militia to like, you know, fight off these various threats and so on. That was Kathy holding a gun. Sorry. Um, so that's that's the situation in Virginia. They desperately needed English people to come over and work. And they and, and most of these people came. Some people immigrated voluntarily and, you know, served as accountants and lawyers and other things. But um the most most of the population settling Virginia were people who had who had signed up as indentured servants, whether you whether it was, you know, somebody serving in somebody's house, but more, most mo far and away, most of them on the plantations. And they did so eventually side by side with people imported, kidnapped from and imported from Africa in the course of the African slave trade, who, however, early on also came in as servants because this concept of slavery hadn't yet been invented. We're going to watch now how it gets invented. So the early, the Africans, the Africans kidnapped and brought early to Virginia where under the regulations that you guys looked at, worked side by side on the tobacco plantations with the English and the Irish and the other eventually British peoples, after 1707, British peoples, who emigrate for whatever reason, most of the time under these contracts, these, these agreements to work for a term of years. Everybody initially coming into the colony was working for a term of years. Everybody. Which is why, for example, when you're reading the excerpt from Henning, you see prohibitions on people called free Negroes running for office, owning guns, owning livestock, marrying English people. So it seems like there's this, remember, you don't pass a law unless there's an actual problem, right? You're not going to go randomly passing laws unless, you know, you need to actually restrain an actual, you want to change a situation that you're seeing on the ground. People just don't, don't just go randomly passing laws. 
Um, all those regulations tell you that there was a uh, discernible, um, detectable, free Negro population, that is, people who had been um, brought into Virginia as servants of other people or to, in order to serve on the plantations, many of them not straight from Africa, but from the West Indies, places like where Guano was enslaved, um, uh, were working as actually as indentured servants in this on, on, in the tobacco plantations in Virginia in this period. Well, the excerpt you looked at starts with an act to regulate runaways. The problem was, just like the, the indigenous populations could say, okay, I've had it with you guys. This used to be my home, but, you know, I'm just going to go west. <laughs> the problem was, <laughs> at a certain point, people working the who started working for other people in the tobacco plantations, black, white, what have you, right? From all, you know, English, African people coming via the West Indies, coming back from Europe, wherever. They were people, these people looked at that and said, you know what? That's not a bad idea. We could just head out, go West, you know, 20 miles, 40 miles. They'll never find us. And a lot of people went and actually lived with the indigenous Native American Indian populations or struck out on their own, whatever, depending on their skill set. Um, and the problem was, what in particular, when you got English servants running away with Negro servants, they could pretend to be masters and servants because you've got, you know, English people who could pretend to be owners and Negroes who could pretend to be their servants. And instead, they're all really somebody else's servants. It was a kind of solidarity, right? Let's, go, let's head out together and we can pass as, you know, a, a master, as masters and servants together. Servants now, not slaves yet. What the law was concerned to do was to criminalize running away, in particular to criminalize English running away together with Negroes, with Africans, right? People of African descent, because it was so hard to detect and they could get away more easily. And so what they did was, in order to punish them, they'd add years. They'd say, oh, you signed up for five years, you're gonna have to work another four years, or you're gonna have to work another two years, or you're gonna have to work another eight years. And that's the punishment. It was a way to deter people. And so they would deter English people, and the penalty was higher if English people ran away with Negroes again, because that that was a that was a much a much uh, a much more successful gambit, a much more successful venture. And so they really needed to penalize that one. The penalty needed to be higher. What happened was, at a certain point, some of the Negro servants show up in court, charged with these crimes, running away. And the court finds, and the court, and I, you know, you, I don't know whether you realize this or not, but it's the same as the legislature. This is, these colonies are run sort of more like military colonies or corporate colonies. The, 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 the judges are the legislators, are the executives, and so it's all the same people. Um, the, the, the Negro slaves would show up in court as runaways, and the judge would need to punish them and the crime for running away has been an addition of years. But at a certain point we see in the statute, the judge in the, in, who's reporting out, who's reporting out the, uh, the, 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 or the legislature, the, the new statute, which solves this problem says, okay, now there's an issue though, because some of these indig some of these indentured servants can't, can't, basically, you know, make up the time they owe, can't pay their, can't pay their criminal debt, can't serve their penalty because they're serving, and this is the language in the statute, indefinitely. So Negro servants serving indefinitely. That's the, that's the first sign that there's something about being an African and, and being an indentured servant in Virginia that's maybe going to be somehow different. And not just any African, just being Africans who are serving as indentured servants. This doesn't apply to free Negroes. It doesn't apply to um, it doesn't apply to free Native American Indians. It doesn't apply to the English who aren't working as indentured servants. So there, there's this pe this penalty structure in terms of adding years that at some point doesn't work with the, the, the Negro indentured servants because there's, they've, there's been a transition and they're seen as working indefinitely. Well, to be an indefinite servant, 
To be a servant indefinitely is to be a servant forever, probably. And that's where the concept of slavery comes from under the legal regime in Virginia. And there are a whole bunch more steps to this, and I won't burden you with all of it um, because time is short. But um, they um, initially, the English who ran away got the lightest punishment, but the Irish who ran away got heavier punishments because the English looked over at the Irish and they saw them as like, you know, a step better than the Africans because they're Irish, they're Catholics. It was, it was, it was part of that old fight and, you know, the, the sort of ethnic, um, animus that, um, that, that, uh, English, uh, English people of English origin had to the Irish is, you know, that's still, it's still with us even today. I mean, some of you may have heard, may have heard when, um, the current president was inaugurated. He's the, only the second Catholic um, after John F. Kennedy in American history because the anti-Catholic animus is extremely significant. Um, you know, we don't see it on the U.S. Supreme Court. That's sort of flipped. But um, the in terms of in terms of the executive, Biden is the, is the second Catholic in history. Uh, all these presidents, you only get a second Catholic. That should tell you something, right? So that so this animus between the English and the Irish, which goes back to the religious disputes between Catholicism and Protestantism in Protestantism in the British Isles, it's still very much it's still very much driving this. Well, then it turns out well the Irish stopped coming. <laughs> the Irish stopped coming. They're like, forget that. I'm not going to serve longer. Um, and, you know, the, the reason that they served longer would be if they, you know, if they if, if, if they showed up with a contract, but they didn't have evidence of the contract and so on. So that's that there's a whole piece there, which is a fun story to tell, but I won't bother you with it. Um, and then they so they change it and they say because only the English people serve the lighter penalty. Everybody else serves the heavy penalty, including the Negro servants, including the Negro servants. And then they say, oh, well, but the English as well as the Irish, but not the not the not the not the aliens and the infidels. Um, and so there's this, this sort of evolution over the 17th and the 18th centuries in these statutes where initially they're talking about country of origin and only later do they start talking about color. And only later than that, at the end, right, at the end of the excerpt you see sort of in the, like in the 1740s, the 1750s, do we see an equivalence between being um, a Negro indentured servant and serving indefinitely being, they actually use the word slave. At the same time, roughly within 10 or 15 years that the word slave becomes tied to being a Negro indentured servant. Again, this does not include the free Negroes. This is before being free and being a person of African descent is outlawed in the South, is outlawed in the colony. That doesn't happen for a while. Um, there are lots of free, lots of, lots of free persons of African descent, but the indentured servants have to serve indefinitely. Around the same time they start using the term slave for those people, you also see a shift to the use of the word white for the, the other ones, the other ones, because before that they're English, oh, but they're English and Irish, and then they, they experiment for a while, oh, okay, well, that's, that, that, that's, that excludes too many people. We're talking about Christians or people who come from a Christian country or who were Christian in a Christian country. Um, baptism alone isn't enough because, you know, the, the Negro population, the indentured servant, Negro populate, the indentured Negro servant populations were getting baptized. So they had to like come up with all these different ways to like separate out the line. So it wasn't racial at first. It was national and it wasn't slavery at first. It was indentured servitude. So you can look over the course of these statutes in Virginia and see the development of a new concept of race, racial difference, white and Negro, at the same time, for example, that Blumenbach and these people are writing their degeneration theories, and at the same time that this notion of slavery as being tied to a person's phenotype is starting to emerge. It's like, oh, if you're African, you must be a slave. If you are Negro, you must be a slave. That happens over, a, over more, it takes more than 100 years for the, for the colonies and later for the southern states to work that out. Um, this, so this is in terms of our understanding of this period in terms of racial difference and explaining racial difference. Some of the, ca some of, some of the causal accounts are sort of straightforward theological, straightforward empirical, observational. Clearly, there's a massive ideological element. We saw a lot of that in Popkin's overview. But there's also a, basically a corporate uh, uh, capitalist um, 
drive to get a certain amount of labor and reliable labor and labor you can hang on to in the new colony and labor that you can use to sort of fend off competition from other Europeans and from um, the indigenous Native American Indian population. So this, 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 this sort of parallel legal development both relies on but also drives, that is, influences the emerging accounts of um, what's, what are presented as scientific accounts of racial difference um, by these various theories, theorists in Europe. You know, with the exception of Coguano, who is clearly pushing back on it, but he's pushing back on it, you know, using the same tradition, using the same material, you know, referring to a very different life experience and a very different, you know, sort of pr perspective on the thing, in my view, having a stronger argument. You can see 